Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and today I'm bringing you a surprise book overview. This might be my one and only book overview I ever do. There are some other books I might make an, an exception due to rarity in the future, but as of now, this is probably going to be my only book overview. Now, in book overviews, I'm not reviewing the book, I'm just sharing what's inside of it. And the book in question is something I've been dying to get my hands on ever since I learned about the Goosebumps art book for Barnes & Noble, like the exclusive, with the uh, Dorman and Jacobus covers in it. I found this, and I haven't seen anybody talk about this, and it seems like to be a couple years old. Um, I was planning on doing a haul video <laughs> and showing this beforehand, but uh, after waiting seemingly forever for this to come in the mail, and on top of that, all the other books that I'm waiting on haven't even come yet at the time of making this, I just couldn't wait any longer. I had to share this information with you guys. And I know Michael Goosebumps fan recently picked up this book, and I'll, I'm curious to hear his thoughts on it. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to do a review, or maybe he'll do an overview on it. Um, but I can't wait to hear what he thinks about it as well. So the book in question is Viewer Beware, The Goosebumps TV Companion by Jose Prendes. Now this is uh, a fan written book that a couple of people haven't had the opportunity to get their hands on. One of which is being um, a Goosebumps Wiki moderator by the name of Spongy444. He's a great commenter, great supporter of my channel. And I've gotten to know him pretty well. He's recently joined that one Goosebumps podcast over on Brandon Symes' channel. And I will link all the new members that we've acquired for the podcast. We got Brandon Syme. Reviewer Beware, Bumps in the Night, Josh Refuse Incorporated, myself, and two new members, Bubs Reviews, and Spongy444. And I will link everybody who has YouTube <clears throat> in the description of this video, and I'll link Spongy's uh, WordPress doc, where his blog is. I'll link that in uh, the description as well. So, I sent some information in this book. As you can see, a lot of information. I sent some... Uh, relative unknown information over to Spongy and he recently updated the Goosebumps wiki so everything I'm about to share you share with you that uh, kind of confirm some things or shed some light on some things have been updated on the Goosebumps wiki so for any episodes in question in this companion uh, if you're wondering if it's been updated just go check the episode most likely it is okay so in this book overview as you can see the mound <laughs> that's destroying my spine of this book, I bookmarked all of these key points in this that I wanted to share in this book overview. So this might be a long video, but these are all really cool facts about the original TV show that I wanted to share with you guys. And it deals with the lore of the show, uh, it has some interviews with the people behind the scenes, giving some information that's really interesting stuff. So stay tuned and let me get through this mound of stuff here. So, for starters, it has a really cool way of setting it up. It goes season by season. So, I'm going to start with season one. And it says, original air date, October 27th, 1995 through May 17th, 1996. <clears throat> so, it opens up to the episode one, Haunted Mask. The Haunted Mask. So, here's some uh, facts about the series mythology that kind of confirm some things. I've heard people kind of deny this in the past, uh, this one fact, so I just want to clear it up. So, the uh, first thing I want to share with you is, the pilot suitably debuting the series during Halloween is the first of the 16 one-hour, aka two-part episodes. This episode breaks some kind of cosmic rule because the two female leads are both named Catherine. And that's not all. Catherine Long plays Carly Beth and Catherine Short plays Sabrina. Holy moly. Mind blown, right? <laughs> I like the way he writes some of these uh, series mythology stuff. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm not going to pick every single episode. I'm going to pick all the uh, most interesting stuff. You know, if I picked every single episode, I'd literally be here all day. So... If you want to know anything that from an episode I may have missed or didn't cover in this video, put a comment in the comment section, hey, what does it say about the series mythology for this episode? And I'll type it in the comment section for you. 
All right, let's get back to the series mythology. <clears throat> the Haunted Mask is writer Jose Rivera's only brush with the show. He's best remembered as a co-creator and writer for the spiritually similar kids series, Eerie Indiana, in 1991. This is the first of six episodes that director Timothy Bond will home. Technically, it's three episodes because they were all two-parters. This episode is introduced Rod Serling style by R.L. Stein himself. Catherine Long insisted on using real worms for reality's sake during the worm in the uh, tuna fish sandwich scene. That's some serious commitment. So, um, yeah, so Catherine Long actually bit into a real worm in that scene. And she was committed to having some authenticity to it. <laughs> so that's really cool to know about the show. I never knew that, so that's cool. And the last thing it says is, apparently Mr. Stein cameos among the trick-or-treaters. And my daughter swears she saw his mask among the masks in the novelty shop. But I combed through this episode and couldn't find it. So there is some hidden Easter egg in this one. So if you want to watch Haunted Mask 1, uh, Part 1 and Part 2, and look for the uh, R.L. Stein mask in the novelty shop, that might be a fun thing to look for. So the next one I'm going to jump to is... I'm going to jump around here. I'm jumping all the way to Welcome to Camp Nightmare for some uh, serious mythology. <clears throat> Alright, so this is director Ron Oliver's first of 16 episodes for Goosebumps, coming close to matching the 17 episodes he directed for Are You Afraid of the Dark? However, he only wrote two episodes of Dark, but beat that record on this series by writing seven episodes of Goosebumps. That's pretty impressive. He wrote seven episodes himself and directed. Hats off to you, Ron Oliver. Writer Jeff Cohen's first of two, technically three, scripts. He will return to write season two's Ghost Beach. So the same writer who wrote Welcome to Camp Nightmare wrote Ghost Beach. Here's another really cool fact I found really interesting here. Um, it's also worth noting that this is the only time in the TV series... When the Goosebumps books that were adapted were in order, with last episodes, The Girl Who Cried Monster being book number eight, and this one being book number nine. So this is episode five in season one. Episode four was The Girl Who Cried Monster. So books eight and nine were told in order. And that's the only time it happened in the show's history. So that's a really cool fact. So we're going to jump ahead here. All right, so we're jumping all the way to Phantom of the Auditorium here. Writer Bruce Edwards' first of two episodes for the series. He will go on to write this season's Say Cheese and Die. Actor Sean Potter, a.k.a. Zeke, Stuart Stone, a.k.a. Brian, and Eric Fink, Emil, will not be seen in this series again, but will appear in Are You Afraid of the Dark? Mr. Potter alone appears a whopping three times. So the, the main characters in the story, I'm assuming, only ever appear in Phantom of the Auditorium in the Goosebumps series. As normal, they had reoccurring actors. Um, the, these main people went to Are You Afraid of the Dark instead. And this one's a really cool fact. I've actually seen Spongy bring this up. This is a... <laughs> it's a, a, a kind of a deep meta fact here. Uh, actor Julia, a.k.a. Julie Annis... Chantry, who plays Tina, does not return to the series, but coincidentally appeared as Terry in the 2000 Disney TV movie Phantom of the Megaplex, another adaptation of Gaston Leroux's classic The Phantom of the Opera, which that's, that's pretty cool. You know, apparently that actress got typecasted <laughs> to play in Phantom of the, Auto, uh, Phantom of the Opera adaptations. So the next one in season one we're jumping to is Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. This one had some pretty cool stuff. This is director William Fruitt's first of 27 episodes he will helm, becoming the most prolific director in the Goosebumps TV series. This is a pretty solid fact. William Fruitt is very famous in the old show, and he starts here with uh, Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. And there's no wonder I like it, because most of William Fruitt's stuff I really loved. Even Deep Trouble in some ways, even though that's a, just a terrible episode. I, I appreciate some parts about it. 
So, yeah, William Fruitt, thank you for your dedication to the show and help create memories for all of us. So, in case you're out there watching. <laughs> Actor Ben Cook, who played Jerry, will basically become a regular around here. He will return to the series two more times, technically three, when we see him again in the season two parter, Welcome to Dead House, in season three's Shock Around Shock Street. Actor Erica Luttrell, who played Kim, will return to the series in season two's Attack of the jack o -Lanterns. And this is the most interesting fact about Piano Lessons Could Be Murder, and I think this is also common knowledge if you're familiar with IMDb database and all that. The great character actor Aaron Tager, who played Dr. Shriek, finally appears in Goosebumps after his run of six episodes playing the beloved recurring character Dr. Vink on Are You Afraid of the Dark? Aaron Tager, great job on Are You Afraid of the Dark? And you did a really good, really good job playing uh, the piano teacher and Piano Lessons Could Be Murdered. All right, Dr. Shriek, I think, yeah. So now we're going to go to Return of the Mummy. All right, so this one has some pretty cool facts here. Um, okay, so let's start with this one. This episode is actually an adaptation of the sequel book, Return of the Mummy, instead of the first Egyptian adventure with Gabe, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb. And that's why the mummy returns, even though we never saw it before. So it says in the story the mummy has returned, but we never saw it beforehand, so it's a context issue. But, yeah, that's just common knowledge thing if you think about it. Um, Daniel DeSanto, who played Gabe, appears here after starring as Tucker, one of the recurring Midnight Society members in Are You Afraid of the Dark? His Egyptian adventure took place between the original cancellation of Dark and the revival in 1999, where he took the lead in the Midnight Society. DeSanto is the only member of the Midnight Society to appear in the Goosebumps series. So, if you ever watch Are You Afraid of the Dark, you know, the campfire where the Midnight Society gathers around and throws the magic sand into the fire and tells the tale. The actor uh, in Return of the Mummy was the only member from that Midnight Society to ever star in Goosebumps. Anik Abansawin, who plays Sari, returns to the series in body only as the actor inside the Slappy costume for season two's Not of the Living Dummy 3. And this one was a really cool fact as well. Peter Jarvis, who walked like an Egyptian as Prince Koru, was apparently the go-to mummy guy because he will appear in another bandaged bedazzled dead guy in season two's Don't Wake Mummy. All right. So now we're getting into Night of the Living Dummy 2 series mythology. Slappy's first appearance is an adaptation of the second book in the Dummy series. The first one featured a different evil dummy, and that's probably why there isn't an adaptation for the Night of the Living Dummy 1. Writer Rick Drew's first of 10 episodes for the series starts here. Ron Stefaniuk, creature creator in FX jack-of-all-trades for the entire run of the series, steps into the limelight as the voice of Slappy. Cathal Dodd, however, steps into Slappy's voice for Season 2's Night of the Living Dummy 3. Ron will return to voice the character in Slappy's third appearance, Season 3's Bride of the Living Dummy. As a side note, Ron was later a puppeteer on the film Bride of Chucky, and no doubt leaned on his Slappy experience, since he also puppeteered our favorite wooden villain. And that's basically it. All right, so let's go over to the next one, which we have My Hairiest Adventure, okay? Now, these are two really cool ones I found. That's why I marked this one. There seems to be some discrepancy as to this episode's order in the series. According to air dates, it's episode 11, but some have it listed as episode 13, with the two-parter stay out of the basement coming first. However, according to air dates, this episode showed first, so I am sticking with the air date order. So, he put My Aries Adventure in front of Stay Out of the Basement because he's going off air dates. Director David Wary Smith's first and only time helming an episode. So, My Aries Adventure was directed by a one-time director. 
And it was also written by a uh, one-time writer by the name of Michael Short. The unassuming doctor that sets Larry on his hair-raising journey is named Merkin. The term Merkin stands for fake pubic hair. Coincidence? You decide. <laughs> so that's a cool fact. Uh, stay out of the basement. Now this one has some um, pretty cool facts you guys should know. Writer Sean Kelly will only write the Stay Out of the Basement two-parter and never cross paths with Goosebumps again. So the writer who wrote the Stay Out of the Basement two-parter, that's the only thing in Goosebumps he ever wrote. The video game Casey is seen playing is pixelated footage from the episode Welcome to Camp Nightmare. This is the first time an episode references another episode as an indirect way of doing so. If you really think about it, that means that none of these Goosebumps stories exist in the same universe. So what he's saying is, since they're indirectly put in the episodes, it's implied that none of the episodes from the series can be interpreted as uh, in the same universe. Which, I don't know, I think that's kind of debatable, because it's kind of like up to the imagination, but I'm just saying what he's saying. I think that's pretty uh, fair information, so if you guys agree with that, go with it. So now we're going to Say Cheese and Die, which is episode 15 of season 1. Now there's a lot of good information here. Alright, so writer Bruce Edwards' final episode for Goosebumps. This was the last one he wrote in season 1 and the rest of the series. Actor Richard McMillan, who played Spidey, not only returns to Goosebumps in the season 3 episode Teacher's Pet, but coincidentally enough starred as the photographer with the mysterious camera in the Are You Afraid of the Dark episode, The Tale of the Curious Camera, which also starred Christian Tessier, who played Mickey Ward, and was directed by Ron Oliver himself. Was Ron Oliver planning a secret alternate reality sequel? The Magic Ape all points to yes, as far as I'm concerned. So if you don't know, Ron Oliver directed Say Cheese and Die, and then he directed the uh, Tale of the Curious Camera over in Are You Afraid of the Dark, hiring the person who played Spidey to be the photographer in the Are You Afraid of the Dark story, even hiring specific actors, and it's about the same plot. <laughs> How coincidental can you get? All right. Let's see here. During Greg's dream sequence, this episode's famous Goosebumps book cover of the skeletons at the barbecue is faithfully reproduced. When we meet the bullies, Greg called them Joey Ferris and Mickey Knox, but the character of Mickey is credited as Mickey Ward, as it originally appears in the book. Was this a goof? A typo? Magic 8-Ball has no answers for this one. Okay. Next one we're going to talk about is Night and Terror Tower series mythology. In reality, there is no Terror Tower, but it is a reference to the Tower of London, a famous tourist spot and former torture dungeon. This series, filmed in Canada, needed a stand-in for the tower. So this two-parter was filmed at the Casa Loma Castle in Toronto, which does not date back to the Middle Ages, but the early 1900s. And then it goes into Catherine Short starring as Sabrina in Haunted Mask 1 and Haunted Mask 2. Alright. So now we're jumping to Werewolf of Fever Swamp. All right, so cool uh, series mythology here. We get another fun meta wink when we look at Grady Skateboard in the background in a particular scene when we see the haunted mask image from the cover of a Goosebumps book slapped on the bottom of it. It's a pretty cool meta nod. So that's wrapping up season one. Uh, if there's any episodes I didn't cover for season one, just type in in the comment section and I'll type in uh, a response to you what the book has. So in season two, we're jumping all the way to Attack of the Mutant. I couldn't find any info on this, but I'll bet that actor Dan Wary Smith, who played Skipper, is related to the director of My Harry's Adventure, David Wary Smith. <laughs> Last name coincidence, you know. <laughs> Look closely and you'll see some conspicuous advertising for Goosebumps on the side of a bus, giving it a resounding two thumbs up. So there's an Easter egg to look for in the episode. Look at the bus and look for the sign for Goosebumps. That's cool. All right, now we're jumping to 
bad hair day. So, these are the two most interesting ones I wanted to bring up. Comedian Colin Mockery cameos as a stone-faced stagehand rescuing Tim from the locked room. You might know Colin Mockery from Whose Line Is It Anyway? He's a very famous contestant uh, or, you know, s series uh, regular on that show. There's a fun reverence to Senor Wences, the famous ventriloquist who is best bit, whose best-known bit would include a final dialogue with this puppet where he would ask the puppet in the box if it was all right and the puppet would seemingly respond from inside saw all right and l sydney himself drops that nugget for those paying attention so in the episode it references the senor wince's famous ritualist act he used to do all right so now we have something for headless ghost the first and only episode directed by series cinematographer brian r r hebb who will wind up photographing 32 of the Goosebumps episodes. The use of the name Hill House is most likely a reference to the famed haunted house in the novel The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, which has been adapted into two movies and with a new TV show version in the works. Now we're going to jump to... Let's see here. Now we're going to jump to Ghost Beach. And here's something I wanted to bring up. Um... Writer Jeffrey Cohen ends his run on the series after pinning the two-parter Welcome to Camp Nightmare last season. So this is his final episode he works on. Actor Dorothy Gordon, who played Agatha, doesn't return to Goosebumps, but her first TV appearance was the original voice of Piglet and Christopher Robin in the 1952 Winnie the Pooh series. So that's cool. <laughs> Everybody watched Winnie the Pooh when they were a kid. You gotta admit it. All right, so now we're jumping to Let's Get Invisible. Director Ron Oliver cameos as one of the Mirror World's victims. He's the only one screaming while pulling a yellow hat on his head. Max is basically wearing a Goosebumps cap throughout the third act of the episode. It's supposed to symbolize the G for his baseball, ha baseball team, the Giants. But we all know the font very well by now, don't we? So the font is the same G from Goosebumps, apparently been a while since i saw the episode so i gotta look for that so more monster blood some cool series mythology here while there are four monster blood novels by rl stein as of this writing this episode is an original spin-off from the first part the real sequels were never made into an episode but elements are shared between them including the recurring character of conan the bully the original title to this episode was flight monster blood which would have been amazing and sounds even more like a sequel spin-off title. This episode is the first of four original episodes created strictly for the TV series. We won't see the other three until this, the next season with the trilogy. Uh, trilogy. Trilogy trilogy. <laughs> okay. Now we're skipping through a little bit of uh, season two here. Uh, we're pretty much going to the tail end, I think. Nope. So we're going to go all the way to Season 3. There's nothing else interesting I found for Season 2. Uh, but Season 3 has some interesting stuff. Let's go here. So we got My Best Friend's Invisible. Alright. In one scene, Sam is watching footage from Season 2's Scarecrow Walks at Midnight on the TV. Hedge House is a repurposed set that was last seen in Vampire Breath, Don't Wake Mummy, and the staircase was also used in Welcome to Dead House and How to Kill a Monster. So, you know, the uh, staircase scene in How to Kill a Monster where they have to leave the monster up and fall to the ground. And then the staircase scene where they're fleeing the zombie vampires in Dead House. Uh, that same staircase was used. So, repurposed set. Sounds about right. <laughs> Alright, let's go. Alright, so, this one's Werewolf Skin. Now, this one... Has some cool series mythology behind it. Um, Maria Vakratisis, Big Edna, the bus driver, will return for the series finale in season four's two parter, Deep Trouble. The Chiller Magazine ad for the photo contest features what looks like a production still from season two's Calling All Creeps. The other mask looks like the one from Haunted, The Haunted Mask. After Keegan McIntosh, Alex, 
makes a brief mention of the X-Files, and coincidentally enough, he appeared in that show four years earlier in the episode titled Fire. That's pretty cool. Now we're here with Strain Peas. Writer Rick Drew bids a fond farewell to the series here after pinning ten episodes. He joined the team back in season one with Night of the Living Dummy 2 being his first episode. In one scene, Nicholas's pal, Sam, lifts up a toy block and asks him if he's seeing things. And if you look close, you will see a Goosebumps G on the block facing the camera for another meta wink wink. So now we're jumping to Say Cheese and Die again. The names of a few crew members from this series make cameos as Mr. Sauer's students, indicated by his roll call sheet, and include art director Ian Brock, assistant director... David Forsyth, and producer Lena Cordina, among others. I think that's how you say her last name. All right. And now we're going to jump to Trilogy uh, Part 1. The Trilogy episodes are the only three completely original Goosebumps episodes written by series scribes Billy Brown and Dan Angel. Season 2's More Monster Blood was original, but shared certain elements with the Monster Blood book series. Trilogy Part 2, series editor Robert K. Spragas cameos here as the umpire. He will leave the series after editing Trilogy Part 3, having racked up 36 episodes in total. Blink and you'll miss it, but Matthew's bookshelf is holding up a whole bunch of Goosebumps books in this episode. Then in Trilogy Part 3, one of the stories in Carlsville is called the Cuckoo... I mean, one of the stores in Carlsville is called the Cuckoo Clock of Doom. Named after the Goosebumps book of the same name. But if you look closer, it is covered in movie posters. So it is, a, is it a clock store or a movie theater? Again, more questions. And then Teacher's Pet. This confirms an urban legend I've brought up in my Ten Urban Legends about the show. Actor Michelle Reese, who played Becca, gets the episode dedicated to her because she passed away on December 4th, 1997 from meningitis. Shortly after filming the episode. Farewell, Michelle. Director Stefan Schianis helms his first and only episode with the series here. So yeah. And now we're going to jump to season four. And we're going to jump all the way to Cry of the Cat. Writer-director Ron Oliver will return for an uncredited rewrite on the final two-parter next episode. But his official swan song is with this episode. So this was actually Ron Oliver's last episode. But it just aired out of sequence. He leaves the series here having directed 16 episodes, starting all the way back in season 1 with the two-parter, Welcome to Camp Nightmare. When Allison's script for the movie falls on the ground, we get a clear shot of the cover, and it looks like the script for this episode because it reads, Goosebumps 4, meaning season 4, number 1, assume, assuming. Cry the Cat, part 1. It's also way smaller than a feature script would be. A musical string from the theme song accompanies it, so I'm guessing it was all done as a meta joke. The walls of the studio where the cat movie is being filmed is plastered with Goosebumps Ephemera, which includes the bus ad from Attack of the Mutant and the One Day at Horrorland Horrorland sign. And now we're going to Deep Trouble. Director William Fruitt's 27th and final episode for the series. Co-writer Jessica Scott's first and only episodes for the ser series but ironically enough, in 2018, she wrote another deep sea horror tale with the film deep, uh, for the film Deep Blue Sea 2. And let's see if it has anything else. And then that ends all the uh, series mythology stuff. Now we're going to the Talking Bumps section, which has Cathal Dodd, Rick Drew, Brian R.R. Hebb, Steve Levitin, and Ron Oliver quotes here. Now these are some pretty cool stuff, guys. So... I'm going to pick, I picked the best stuff that I saw in this that kind of gives some cool facts. So stay tuned. All right. So the question was, how did you end up doing Slappy for Night of the Living Dummy 3? I had done the theme song for the TV series. All the sounds you hear in the theme song, including the dog, are me. I was then asked to audition for the character Slappy. And then it says, how did you warm up? your voice to get into character i spend time studying the script and then when i get into the studio there are visuals 
all the characters which I have voiced are my own vocal creations, so they live in my head. <laughs> the next one we're going to is Rick Drew. Now this guy here drops some serious information about the show. So, let's start here, uh, which is a big question here. Were you able to pick the books you adapted, or were they chosen for you? Rick answered, no. It was entirely up to uh, Dan Angel and Billy Brown. Did you read the books before adapting them, or were you just given a brief synopsis from someone? When the series first started, they would send me the books, or I would just pick them up at a local bookstore. But as I continued to adapt the stories over the run of the series, I would sometimes get a gallery version of a book that had not been published yet. So sometimes he would get the books way in advance because they wanted to be ahead of the release schedule for the episode. You wrote 10 one-off episodes in series icon Slappy kicked it off with Living Dummy 2. Living Dummy 2 was the first of my episodes to air, but the second one I adapted. I was very lucky to be asked to adapt Living Dummy 2. How cool is it to be the first one to bring Slappy to the screen? I couldn't help but feel some connection when I saw the first Goosebumps movie and saw what a big part Slappy had in the story. Of course, the tradition of the scary ventriloquist dummy goes all the way back to the Twilight Zone, as well as the dummy segment in the classic 1945 British horror anthology film Dead of Night. My favorite is still Magic, a novel and movie by William Goldman. Okay, so, this right here answers your question, why Night of the Living Dummy 1 never got made. And I'm going to put this in the comment section. Fast forward to uh, 3146 for this. What prompted the decision to start with 2 instead of the first book? I don't know why, but Dan and Billy felt the second story was a stronger one to start with. The challenge with all the Goosebumps stories is that some of them don't have a lot of real plot, and their traditional TV sense of storytelling. Some of them needed more fleshing out than others to make an entertaining half hour of TV. Also, what's scary in a kid's book is not necessarily going to be scary for TV, so that's all part of the process. Then it goes into some really cool uh, factoids about some episodes he worked on, um, which I went ahead and highlighted this last one here because these get pretty long. How long did you have to write your scripts usually? I would do an outline followed by a draft and then a second draft of the script. From there, it would go to Dan and Billy to make changes for production or whatever was necessary. I would usually have about a week for the outline and no more than a week or maybe two for the draft. A few days for the second draft. The available time depended on if I was writing before or during production. But if any writer for TV will tell you, the faster you get a script in, the better. TV feeds on script pages. Alright, and yeah, that's about it. So now we're going to move on to Brian R.R. R. Hebb, which um, I didn't really mark anything, but if you guys want to listen to something from Brian R.R. R. Hebb, leave a comment. I'll type in what I uh, some interesting stuff I might find after the video. So now we're jumping to Steve Levitin, who was a producer on the show. And this was the very, <laughs> very first thing that caught my eye. How receptive was R.L. Stein toward the adaptations? Did he give any input? He reviewed every single first draft and was a fantastic support to the project. Meaning R.L. Stein overviewed more Monster Blood and Trilogy. So maybe R.L. Stein does have involvement. Hmm. Interesting. How did you si decide what books to adapt? We based the choice mainly on which books had the strongest characters and which would be the most practical to adapt into moving pictures. How did you decide which books warranted two episodes versus a one-and-done approach? That was primarily based on the complexity of the story, the ambition of the effects slash animatronics, or animal wrangling, and which might have to be strong enough hooks to sustain at longer length or in the home video market as standalone episodes. What 
<laughs> was it your decision to make Billy Brown and Dan Angel the story editor story editors? We and Scholastic decided together. Bill Siegler, one of the production supervisors, had worked for them before. They were a miraculous choice for the project. All right. Okay. So here we go. Did you ever have any... Hold on. Did you ever have any issues with the censors when it came to scary stuff for kids? Not with censors per se, but the original Haunted Mask one hour episode had an ending that Fox Kids felt was too scary, so we re-edited it to make it a bit milder. Hmm. Why didn't the series continue past season four? Fox Kids decided not to renew it. They were going through some internal changes at the time. Our cancellation was a byproduct. If you could redo the series today, what, if anything, would you change? Not much, really. Digital effects and animatronics are so much more advanced today, we can do the same things, just amazingly better. And, let's see here. Anything else? Not really. So now we're jumping to Ron Oliver. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and jump through this, get to this point, because I really want to bring up what I saw here. Okay. So... You guys want to know if slap, the Slappy Dummy was initially meant to be Mr. Wood? Here's a close enough answer you're probably ever going to get. You got a tangle with the series icon Slappy on Night of the Living Dummy 2. Was that as fun to make as it was to watch? One of my favorite horror films of all time is called Devil Doll, about a creepy ventriloquist dummy in a nightclub act. So getting to do my version of it with Slappy was great fun. Did you ever worry that Slappy would look too goofy? Nah, he was creepy from the start. I remember sitting on the set alone one afternoon, waiting for everybody to come back from lunch, and Slappy was sitting in a chair near me, just looking at me. Of course he didn't move or anything, or did he? But I moved to another part of the set because he kind of freaked me out just sitting there. So basically he confirmed that Slappy was there for him the first day, and it's always been the same Slappy. So... To answer some questions <laughs> now here we go this one's about werewolf skin this is where it confirms the uh dane angel billy brown split now this has some really cool information here so stay tuned werewolf skin for me takes the most when it comes to suspension of disbelief sometimes things work in a book but on tv not so much i'm curious about how you approach this one He's talking to Ron Oliver. Remember this. The director and supposed writer, but he's not credited. Okay. Ron replies with, Werewolf Skin was a tr troublesome show from the start. To start with, the book didn't really have any plot, just an idea. So at the time when they got the, the idea in, the book was even finished. The script came from the two writers who were also producers on the series, referring to Dan Angel and Billy Brown. But it was unshootable. Too many locations, too many stunts, and it had a scene of the werewolf ripping the head off of a deer on a kid's show, lol. The network got involved, and there were all sorts of arguments, and we had a schedule to keep. Finally, the writers slash producers left the series over that incident, and I ended up rewriting the script in a weekend to start shooting a week later. I liked a lot of the stuff in the show, but I understand what you mean about suspension of disbelief. Why wouldn't the kid just tell somebody? When I delivered my cut to the network, they made us edit a lot of the creepier, gorier stuff out. The aunt and uncle putting on their skin and so forth was just a bit too much to handle for the network. It's been a long time since I've seen the episode, but I'd be fascinated to see if it holds up. I remember one gag in the kitchen scene. The aunt is wearing a Wolverine sweatshirt inside joke. So then... Um, it goes to some pretty uh, last, you know, pretty good information here. Uh, do you have a favorite episode of Goosebumps? It's probably a tie between The Perfect School and Cry of the Cat. He made those. That's probably why. And this one's really good information for all the speculators wondering what if uh, the show continued on. Here's Ron Oliver's answer. According to the official records, there are, there are only four seasons of Goosebumps. Did you find it odd that the series didn't continue past season four? Especially with a brand like Goosebumps so popular on bookshelves. We actually did five seasons worth of a show. But the double episodes of the fifth season 
All right, hold on, let me reread that. We actually did five seasons worth of the show, but... <laughs> okay, this is a serious typo in the book. So they actually did five seasons worth of the show, uh, double the, uh, if you double the episodes for all of the seasons. Okay, let me, let me try this one more time. We actually did five seasons worth of show, but the double episodes of the fifth season sort of make it feel like four. And five seasons is all you need to make a syndicated series, at least it was at the time. So that was all the network wanted. So basically, he felt that they did five seasons worth of episodes. It was just aired within four. Okay. Sorry, I got hung up on that one. It just It's just worded really ridiculous in the book. <laughs> but honestly, it also felt like we had done it already by then. All the stories had been told, and anything we did beyond Cry the Cat would feel like we were just repeating ourselves. We did it once, and we did it mostly well. So why not just finish up on a high note, right? And then it goes into uh, the rest, and that closes it out. So, that being said, um, Jose Prentice did a pretty good job uh, with the series mythology. There's a couple other stuff I probably would add to it. Um, but those interviews he had with um, Rick Drew, Steve Levitin, Ron Oliver tie-ups of loose ends. Basically, uh, we now know that the Slappy, uh, Ron Oliver's point of view, uh, Slappy was always the same Slappy. Uh, according to Rick Drew, uh, Night of the Living Dummy 1 never got made because uh, Dan Angel and Billy Brown said that 2 would be a better book to start with. So they could have made 1. So now we know the truth. They could have made 1. As a matter of fact, they were considering it, but they went with 2 because they thought it was a better story. And the most interesting fact I learned was, uh, from Ron Oliver, was the werewolf skin stuff dealing with Dan Angel's departure and Billy Brown's departure. And then on top of that, um, the controversy behind the episode. And maybe that could have led to other stuff that didn't get touched on in this book. Um, and then also, he kind of said uh, why they were happy to wrap it up in season four, because they felt like they did five seasons worth of show within a four season airtime so yeah basically that's viewer beware the goosebumps tv companion jose prendes overview i know this is an extremely long video i'm glad if you stayed all the way through uh awesome like i said check the description for my fellow podcast mates we have grown in size come check us out at that one goosebumps podcast uh, check for the comment section because i'm definitely going to put in the time where it reveals the night of the living dummy Two getting made over Night of the Living Dummy 1 uh, episode information. So look out for that. And let me know in the comment section if you have read this. Uh, what stuff did you find interesting in, in the book? And if I didn't go over an episode, you might want to learn some series mythology too. And if I didn't cover it in the video, just leave a comment and I'll type in what they have in the book. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.